Great. Well, thank you, Russ, and, and thanks, uh, Steve, for providing that background. So I think we're in a, an exciting era of IBD and that we're getting more into precision medicine. And some of my discussion now are going to be on small molecules, some of which you've started to use and we'll be using more uh, in the future. So this is just a very busy slide that I'm not going to go through in detail, but there are an, a variety of immune-mediated cytokines that have been identified in IBD that we are now targeting either through monoclonal antibodies or through small molecules. Really the one take-home point that I want to put on this slide at the top is we talk about a 30-60 rule in IBD. So when I ask my fellows, how does a medicine work, what's the efficacy in terms of remission, and what's the efficacy in terms of response, it's pretty easy. You can almost answer the same way for everything we have so far, which is a 30% remission rate and about a 60% response rate. Now, some of that's tongue-in-cheek, but the reality is that's where we're more or less stuck today. So small molecules have really emerged on the scene as a new treatment option. Uh, tofacitinib, we'll talk a little bit uh, now, but I'll also mention some of the other small molecules that will probably be coming to your clinics very soon. So you see the small molecule column compared to the biologic column, and you see a variety of factors down the side with the green dots versus red and yellow dots. I think one of the aspects of small molecules that's appealing to our patients is that these are generally oral medicines that are given once or twice a day, so tofacitinib twice a day. The other part of this is there's no immunogenicity. We can start and stop these. The efficacy looks comparable, although we don't have a head-to-head -head with biologics. There are some safety signals that we're discussing, and you've heard at this meeting already. And then the question about cost comes in that small molecules generally in terms of positioning should be or may be a cost that's different or less than the monoclonals. So I'm going to spend a couple of minutes on the JAK inhibition. You heard from the initial sessions this morning about the Janus kinase inhibitors. And really there are four Janus kinase inhibitors, JAK1, 2, 3, and then something called TIC2. Uh, this is, again, not to make uh, an immunology session, but this is just to show you that the Janus kinase inhibitors, this JAK-STAT pathway, actually gets to transcription on a DNA level. So the reason I say this is for our patients who look at taking as a, a pill as a very safe very easy medicine, while that is true, this blocks a central mechanism in terms of the pathway that leads to different cytokine upregulation, which means these are potent immunosuppressive therapies. So this is just an overview on the pipeline of the JAK inhibitors. You see tofacitinib at the top, which actually now has been approved for ulcerative colitis, but you also see filgotinib. We put the red arrow there, which has moved from a phase two to a phase three strategy. And there are a variety of other agents, these other small molecules that are in the pipeline, but really filgotinib and tofacitinib are the two that we're focused on for IBD. You heard at the meeting, I think Ed Loftus mentioned this morning about higher levels of tofacitinib, you get a pan-JAK inhibition. What does pan-JAK mean? Well, tofacitinib blocks JAK1 and 3, but if you use higher doses, we may also block JAK2 and TIC2. And the question is whether JAK2 inhibition, the higher doses, somehow maybe has to do with infection and thromboembolism. That needs to be worked out. One appealing aspect of the oral small molecules is they clear from the body very quickly. This is a practical word of caution. If you have patients in your clinic that you see who have renal insufficiency or renal failure, just know that the drug may last longer because these are renally excreted medications, but their half-life is about three hours. So these are the octave studies um, comparing placebo in purple, tofacitinib in uh, orange, uh, and then the tofacitinib at 10 milligram twice a day in green, looking at response on the left, remission in the middle, and mucosal healing on the right. And you can see actually a nice, um, almost a dose response, but a nice efficacy in terms of benefit over placebo in response and remission and in mucosal healing, with mucosal healing rates as high as 45.7% at 10 milligrams twice a day. 
The safety is obviously something that's been highlighted not only at this meeting, but you've heard recently by the FDA certain label changes and certain label warnings in terms of tofacitinib safety. So when we look at tofacitinib specific to ulcerative colitis, and for those that attended American College of Gastro, there were a couple of presentations on the overall long term. And I should make this very clear, at least in ulcerative colitis to date, we have not seen an increased risk of thromboembolism. So I'll mention that again. We have not seen an increased risk of thromboembolism from tofacitinib in ulcerative colitis. Now that's different when I come to rheumatoid arthritis in a minute. What about zoster? Uh, so this is some of our experience at Cleveland Clinic, and I think some of the published experience uh, matches this, that we do see a higher rate of zoster. We do recommend the Shingrix vaccine, which, as you know, is a two-dose inactivated uh, zoster vaccine, given it zero months and two months. I should also mention a practical tip. Some of you in the room may have had the zoster vaccine. There is a bit of an immune activation after the second vaccine. So if you get that vaccine, I tell my patients they may feel lousy for a couple days. Some of my colleagues actually had to change some of their weekend trips uh, because they felt kind of down and out. So that's more of a practical on the, the Shingrix vaccine. Um, as far as the FDA and the February 19, 2019, so fairly recent, these are some concerns about pulmonary embolism. So I'll just state what I think you've heard already, you may have read, but just to try to make it crystal clear where this is coming from. From the European agencies to start and the FDA to follow, this warning came out in risk of pulmonary embolism and DVT primarily in rheumatoid arthritis patients over the age of 50 who have cardiovascular risk factors. So that was the group that was identified as having the higher risk of thromboembolism at the higher dose of 10 milligram twice a day of tofacitinib, which is traditionally and generally what we use. So, so the agency's recommendations for rheumatoid arthritis was to use the 5 milligram dose twice a day. For us, for inflammatory bowel disease, ulcerative colitis, the recommendation has been that you may use the 10 milligram dose twice a day, but after eight weeks, you reassess your patient, and if they're having a response, lower to five milligrams twice a day. If after another eight weeks, 16 weeks, you reevaluate again if they're not having a full response to 10 twice a day, and if they are, and they are in remission, lower to five twice a day. I will tell you in my practice that the majority of patients who do extremely well at 10 twice a day, when I have lowered to five twice a day, the majority in my practice I've had to increase back to 10 twice a day. So the practical reality is, and the FDA construct does state, that we may use the effective dose longer term. And in ulcerative colitis, that may mean 10 milligrams twice a day. So some of the, the top line here I think is obvious. We do this for our other medicines. Lipids is the one, and you probably have heard, lipid profile has increased both LDL and HDL, but there are no cardiovascular events that we have been seeing. I already mentioned how we use the medication, how we assess after eight weeks, and then ultimately after 16 weeks. And at the very bottom, if they flare on the lower dose of five milligram twice a day, we increase. Again, there's not immunogenicity with tofacitinib, so we can decrease, increase, even stop and restart the medication. So let's switch gears to filgotinib. So filgotinib is a selective oral, um, sorry, oral selective JAK1 inhibitor. So it only picks off or it only blocks JAK1. So this was an interesting study. This is a phase two analysis and you can see the purple here is the filgotinib treatment group compared to the green, which is placebo for clinical remission on the left in the middle clinical response, and then overall a change in the IBDQ, the quality of life score. And you can see pretty clearly that there's a statistical benefit of filgotinib over the placebo in all indications. What about upacitinib? Upacitinib is another uh, selective JAK inhibitor in a phase two, two ulcerative colitis study. And without going through the details, you're going to start seeing the same trends, that this works in terms of response, remission, and in some of the studies, mucosal healing or endoscopic healing. 
So we have TOFA, which JAK1-3, now we're looking at selective JAK1 inhibitors, and we're finding that for two of them, there is benefit. Bill Sanborn, or I think one of the uh, speakers this morning, that said that we may actually now have a gut-selective JAK inhibitor. So this is another interesting mechanism and potentially a safety benefit of targeting on a selective basis the gut JAK inhibition. And this is, again, more stay tuned. So we're in early phases, but I wanted to provide you an overview of the small molecules that are here. So I'm going to wrap it up with a safety um, overview, and then I have one slide on positioning, uh, and then Russ, I think, is going to take us through some cases in terms of how we maybe position some of these treatments. So this is a, a study, um, or I should say a review, that Ben Click and I published earlier this year, uh, and this looks at a safety pyramid, and I think um, some of you may have seen this pyramid before, but this is really not an evidence-based uh, pyramid, so I should just mention up front, this is just based on how we look at the safety overall. It's interesting, I find this tweeted out more than any other pyramid that we've had, which is kind of an interesting feature, but nonetheless, I think it's visually easy to look at this and look at the positioning of safety, where steroids actually I would put all the way at the bottom, and then you've heard this morning combination thiopurine anti-TNF, Probably thiopurine and tofacitinib would come next in terms of safety, anti-TNF as monotherapy, and then I think most of us are feeling fairly comfortable, and it's hard to say parity between vetolizumab and ustekimumab, but at least most of us feel that veto and ustekimumab as monotherapy holds that highest safety benefit, and I think most are feeling that these are fairly safe medications. One thing I should mention, though, is that if you have a very sick patient and you feel that an anti-TNF in combination with a thiopurine, for example, for severe ulcerative colitis, either in the hospital or about to be admitted to the hospital, I will still use that treatment combination because I think in that very sick ulcerative colitis patient, that may be the best treatment. So inadequate or under treatment is also something we should look at as a potential adverse event. So I'm going to actually end there because Russ, I think, is going to take us through some cases. Uh, we might talk about our individual style in terms of how we position, but hopefully that was a good overview for you on the oral small molecules, tofacitinib, but others to come, including filgotinib, and then how we position safety. So thank you very much for attending AIBD, and thank you very much for attending lunch, and we'll get to some cases. <laughs>